So we finally got our hands on the highly anticipated Samsung Odyssey G7, and we're excited to share our results. And some of our findings may surprise you, as they did with us. Hi, I'm Brandon, a test developer at Ratings.com, where we help people find the best products for their needs. The Odyssey G7 is one of the most highly anticipated monitors of the year, and for good reason. Its one-of-a-kind feature set promises to deliver an awesome gaming experience. It's the world's first VA monitor that offers a 1440p resolution at 240 hertz. On top of that, it also claims to have impressive picture quality, including basic display HDR600. With specs like these, it's looking to become the new gaming champion. And for the most part, that's true. But we did come across a few interesting quirks, and we're actively looking into these results to see how typical our findings may be. In this video, we'll first look at the design of the monitor and then move on to picture quality. Afterward, we'll examine the motion handling and input lag to determine its gaming prowess. Finally, we'll finish by comparing it to other competing models on the market. If you'd like to skip straight to our test results, then see the links in the description below. We bought the 32-inch model to test, but it also is available in 27 inches as well, and we expect this smaller size to perform similarly to this one. If you own the smaller model and have any experiences different to our own, let us know in the comments. Let's start with the design. The Odyssey G7 has a modern design with an aggressive curvature that's hard to miss. This is the first monitor we reviewed with a 1000R curvature, and it will definitely be polarizing to some. Samsung claims this is to align with the curvature of the human eye, giving the user a more immersive experience with less eye strain. But we don't test for this, so you'll have to take their word for it. The build quality is great, and the plastic feels solid. The monitor is matte black all around, and has a cool textured finish on the back that expands outward from the center. The core at the center features RGB lighting, as well as two zones under the bottom bezel, both of which can be controlled through the on-screen display. The stand is pretty solid, and it has a decent range of ergonomics. It has good height adjustment, passable swivel and tilt range, and you can even rotate the display for portrait use, which is rare for curved monitors. On the back, there's a removable plastic cover to assist with cable management, and the top of the stand features a headphone hook, which is a nice touch. The base is V-shaped, so you can place objects on your desk around it, but it's still quite large and requires a decent amount of space. And because of the curvature of the screen, the display itself is quite thick, even thicker with the stand. So you'll need a deeper desk to fit it comfortably. If that's an issue, you can always use any number of third-party stands thanks to the VESA adapter that comes included in the box. Now let's take a look at the inputs. The input selection is pretty good and should satisfy most people. There are two DisplayPort 1.4s, one HDMI 2.0, two USB downstream ports that communicate through the USB upstream port, and a 3.5mm audio out. To run this display at its native resolution and refresh rate, you need to be using one of the DisplayPort inputs, since HDMI will only get you up to 144Hz. You also need to use DisplayPort for NVIDIA G-Sync, but FreeSync will work with either connections. This monitor does use an external power brick, and it's very large, so you'll have to find somewhere to hide it away. The controls are located at the bottom of the display below the logo, where there's a single joystick. This works well for navigating the menus. Here, you can change the user all aspects of picture quality, the RGB lighting, and even enable picture-in-picture -picture or picture-by-picture -picture modes. Now we'll move on to picture quality. We'll be comparing to currently available monitors, but competing models may change with new reviews. For an updated comparison with new models as we buy and test them, see the review page on our website. Let's start with the viewing angles. As expected with a VA panel, the horizontal and vertical viewing angles are subpar. Normally, having good viewing angles are important so the colors at the edge of the display don't degrade when sitting up close. However, in this case, the sharp curvature of the monitor helps counteract the poor viewing angles, as long as you're seated in the correct position. That said, this still won't be a great option for sharing your screen with colleagues at the office. Now into contrast, where we got some astonishing results. Contrast ratio is the difference between the darkest black and the brightest white that a screen can display, and is considered one of the most important aspects of picture quality. A high contrast ratio will give a deeper looking image and prevent blacks from looking gray in a dark room. We measured an impressive contrast ratio of 3900 to 1 on our unit, so the image will appear deep and full of detail, even in a darker environment. This is on the higher end of the VA monitors we've reviewed, and is much higher than the 2500 to 1 contrast ratio that Samsung advertises. We even double-checked these measurements using different tools and test patterns and still got the same results, so our unit just performs exceptionally well in this regard. Keep in mind that contrast ratio is disproportionately affected by the measured black level, and a small delta in black level can result in a large change in the contrast ratio. Also, contrast ratio can vary between units, so if you own this model and can measure contrast, let us know how yours compares. Unlike most monitors, the Odyssey G7 has local dimming support. This is a feature that works by turning on and off the individual backlights of the display to help improve perceived contrast. 
It works to varying degrees depending on the number of lighting zones as well as the software implementation. In this case though, it's not very good. There are only a few zones located at the top and bottom of the screen, and the transitions between zones are obvious, at least with our test pattern. It's much less noticeable in real content, however. Because there aren't very many zones, enabling local dimming didn't increase contrast with our test pattern, but this will vary depending on the content being displayed. Now let's take a look at the black uniformity. Issues with black uniformity present themselves as brighter areas around dark scenes, which is commonly known as backlight bleed. This can be distracting when watching dark content, especially in a darker environment. Our unit has decent black uniformity, but there is backlight bleed at the top and bottom of the panel. These issues may be harder to see with local dimming enabled, but again, it's going to depend on the content you're watching. Black uniformity can vary between units due to manufacturing tolerances, so if yours is any different, let us know in the comments. If you plan on using this monitor in a bright environment, like an office, then it's important to have a high peak brightness. We initially measured a pretty mediocre peak brightness in both SDR and HDR, but this was with local dimming disabled. With it disabled, we only got a little over 300 nits in both SDR and HDR. After enabling local dimming, we achieved a much higher peak brightness. In SDR, we measured a 2% peak window at 540 nits, and a 100% sustained window at 333 nits. This means the monitor will appear plenty bright in most cases, and should work well at combating bright ambient lighting. In HDR, we got very similar results to our SDR test, but measured a slightly higher real scene brightness. This still falls short of the 600 nits needed for Samsung's advertised VESA Display HDR600 spec. That said, it should still offer an okay experience to those who aren't too picky about HDR. We're not sure why our unit is short of the listed spec, nor how common this is among other retail units such as our own. The specifications page for the G7 lists the typical peak brightness at 600 nits, but there's no mention of a minimum peak brightness like there is for the regular brightness levels. To those of you who own this monitor and can measure brightness, we'd like to hear what your results are so we can get a better understanding of where our monitor fits within the spectrum. Also important for a bright environment is the reflection handling, which is how well a display counteracts distracting glare from overhead lighting or sunlight. This monitor has a very good reflection handling, so it should work well in most cases, but it may struggle if placed directly in front of a window. If local dimming is enabled, the extra brightness will definitely help against reflections. Now onto the color accuracy. Out of the box, the G7 comes with a plethora of display modes, and we found the FPS mode to be the most accurate. Compared to our sRGB target, there are some inaccuracies with the colors, but it shouldn't be too noticeable. Unfortunately, the gamma tracking is all over the place, making most scenes appear brighter than they should be. After calibration, as expected, all color and white balance inaccuracies are fixed. You can find the ICC profile and calibration settings in the full review on the website, linked in the description below. Do note though, these settings are specific to our unit and should not be copied, as calibration does vary between units. Another important aspect of picture quality is the color gamut, which is the range of colors a screen is capable of displaying. The wider the color gamut, the richer and more saturated the image will look. For SDR content, the G7 has an excellent coverage of the sRGB gamut and pretty good coverage of the Adobe RGB color space. So it'll work great for viewing standard content on the web, but professionals looking to master an Adobe RGB may want to look elsewhere. For HDR content, it has good coverage at about 86% of the P3 color space and 68% of the Rec 2020 color space. Our P3 results may appear lower than what Samsung advertises, but this is because we limit the primaries to the P3 color space when measuring to more closely recreate how P3 content will appear. If we didn't limit the primaries, our results would be closer to around 95%, which is more in line with Samsung's listed spec. Now onto the motion handling and gaming performance, which is where things get really exciting. First, we'll start by taking a look at the refresh rate. High refresh rates are important for gaming, as it will make the games look smoother in motion and feel more responsive to your inputs. The G7 has an outstanding refresh rate of 240Hz, which is especially impressive considering its 1440p resolution. On top of that, it supports FreeSync and is G-Sync compatible certified by NVIDIA. This will make it a great choice for eSports and AAA titles alike. It's important to note, we did receive a lot of reports about visible flickering with VRR enabled. In our testing, we weren't exactly able to recreate these issues, but we did notice a slight brightness change that could happen depending on the content being displayed. This would appear as a sort of dimming that would come and go, and if it were to happen fast enough, it could be interpreted as flicker. We tried out a test photo that reportedly caused flickering with VRR and found that when displaying the image at full screen, it did dim the monitor a bit, but at any other size, the brightness would go back up. We also found a GIF that made the display dim and brighten at certain times, but we were unable to reproduce this behavior in games. This was tested using the latest firmware at the time, 1005.2, and our unit is the FBO2 model, which was manufactured in May of 2020. 
If you own this monitor, let us know if you've experienced any flickering issues. We'd love to hear your feedback. Also important for gaming is the response time, or the time it takes for a display to change from one color to the next. A slow response time can result in a blurry trail behind fast moving objects. So it's important for gaming monitors to have a fast response time to reduce ghosting or smearing. The G7 is quite remarkable in this regard, as it has a very fast response time and is by far the fastest VA panel we reviewed. It even measures as fast as some of our fastest TN and IPS monitors. Being a VA panel, it still struggles with darker transitions, but even in this aspect, it's doing better than all other VA monitors we've tested. Additionally, not only does the G7 have excellent response times at 240 hertz, but it maintains this even at 60 hertz. We found the same overdrive setting of faster to work well for both refresh rates, which is rare for FreeSync monitors. This is nice because you don't have to fiddle with the overdrive settings when switching from a PC to a console in order to get the best motion performance. If you'd like, you can change the response time via an overdrive setting in the menu. You can see how each one affects the motion blur in our full review. Now onto the input lag, which is how long a monitor takes to process and display an image. Having low input lag is important for gaming as it means you'll see the results of your actions faster, resulting in a more responsive experience. The G7 has an exceptionally low input lag of just 2.7 milliseconds at the max refresh rate. This remains nearly the same with VRR enabled. At 60 hertz, it goes up to 9.6 milliseconds, but that's still pretty solid considering the frame rate and shouldn't be noticeable to most people. So overall, the Odyssey G7 is a very exciting and capable monitor with a few quirks. Its high resolution and refresh rate paired with its fast response time makes it very enticing to gamers. It also performs well in picture quality, most notably with contrast, uniformity, and color reproduction. However, it does have some oddities that are hard to explain, such as the numerous reports of flickering. And because we've had difficulty reproducing these, it's hard to say if you'll experience them as well. There's currently nothing on the market like the Odyssey G7, but if you're not 100% sold on it, then there are other options to consider. If you're after 1440p at 240Hz, there's the HP Omen X27, which uses a TN panel instead of a VA. Because of this, it's worse than the G7 in most aspects of picture quality, but it does have a slightly faster response time and is a bit cheaper. If dropping resolution isn't a huge deal, there's an ASUS VG279QM. The ASUS has a slightly higher refresh rate and better viewing angles thanks to its IPS panel, but its pixel density is low and the G7 has better contrast ratio and a wider color gamut. If you like the size and resolution of the G7 and want to keep the benefits of VA, then check out the G7's predecessor, the CHG70. Although its refresh rate isn't as fast and it has worse response times, especially at 60 Hz, the G7 also beats it out in text clarity and has RGB lighting if that's your thing. But the CHG70 does have a better ergonomics and a lower price point. As you can see, many of these alternatives require sacrifices, and even the G7 isn't perfect. So you'll have to prioritize what you want most in a monitor before making a decision. So that's it. What do you think of the Samsung Odyssey G7? Is it the new undisputed champion, or does it fall flat from the hype? Let us know in the comments below. As always, you can check out all of our measurements on our website. And if you like this video, subscribe to our channel or become an insider on the website for access to our latest results first. Also, we're currently hiring in our offices in Montreal for various positions. So if you want to help people find the best products for their needs, have a look at our careers page. Thank you for watching and see you next time.